tardes, bienvenidos una vez más al canal de YouTube del Instituto Cervantes eh, de Manchester y Leeds. Mi, mi nombre es Pedro Sebio, soy el director de los centros. Y esta tarde vamos a tratar un tema especialmente interesante eh, porque eh, no voy a decir que otros encuentros de Hispania no lo hayan sido, eh, sino que especialmente interesante porque es un tema que hasta ahora en el ciclo que tenemos de conferencias sobre las relaciones entre España y Gran Bretaña no lo habíamos tratado y sin duda es algo que daría para, para muchísimas conferencias. Eh, no me voy a extender mucho más en hablar en castellano y voy a realizar ahora la presentación eh, muy brevemente en inglés. Eh, good afternoon and welcome to the YouTube channel of uh, Manchester and Leeds, Instituto Cervantes. I am Pedro Eusebio, the director of this uh, cultural center in uh, Northern England. And today, in our series of Hispania, we will uh, speak about, uh, the, uh, have a debate about a very interesting topic. In our series of Hispania, we analyze with the scholars from different uh, fields the relations uh, in uh, between the UK and Spain from uh, different fields. And uh, for example, we have been analyzing in the history uh, of both countries in uh, different periods. We have also been analyzing the literature in different aspects, prose, poetry, but music is the first uh, event that we will have about uh, uh, in this series of Hispania, and that is why this uh, um, lecture would be especially uh, interesting and important because the music is something that is part of our culture, our our daily life, and what would be uh, analyzed from um, the Professor Duncan Wheeler, our special guest today. Thank you, uh, Duncan, for being with us, for accepting our invitation. He will uh, speak about the most recent cultural and uh, musical relations between Spain and Britain uh, from the end of the, of the period Franco regime to the most uh, contemporary music in both countries. Uh, but uh, first of all, I would like to introduce our guest, uh, Duncan Wheeler. He uh, holds a, um, a master degree and a PhD from uh, Oxford University. He's professor of Hispanic Studies at the University of Leeds, an editor of the Journal of Modern Language Review, and a member of the Hispanic Academy of Performing Arts. He has been visiting and professor of the, at the University of Carlos III in Madrid, Oxford, and uh, UCLA. And his publications include Golden Age Drama in Contemporary Spain, The Comedian on the on Page, the Stage and Screen, and Following Franco, Spanish Culture and Politics in Transition. Let me mention that uh, this book, we have the privilege to to, to be launch, uh, to launch it at the end of the last year with uh, Duncan Willis here in Cervantes, Manchester. And uh, also uh, Duncan writes uh, for the media, both in Spain and the United Kingdom, and has published articles on politics and culture in The Economist, The Guardian, Jot Down, The London Review of Books, The Times Literary uh, Supplement, and many others. So thank you very much, Duncan, for being uh, with us. Thank you to our audience uh, uh, for being uh, with us as well. And uh, let me inform you that at the end of the lecture from Professor Duncan Wheeler, we will have 15 minutes for question and answers. You can write down in the chat and I will put the questions to, to Duncan. Uh, you can also put the questions in both languages, in Spanish, uh, if you prefer so, or in English. And uh, uh, Professor Duncan will uh, answer in English, and we will translate it into both languages. So thank you very much again, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Pedro. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, this is hopefully, this is, as as you will discover, um, or hopefully you won't discover, in fact, is that technology is not my forte, but um, hopefully I can, hopefully even I will manage to make this work. I have to say this is a huge, um, I'm first particularly grateful for this um, invitation. It's always a pleasure to collaborate with the Cervantes, but on this occasion, I mean, it brought together, 
you know, kind of my, sometimes I realize how lucky I am to have a job where basically I do things that I enjoy. And actually for, you know, I began for, I've been as long as I can remember a music fan. And one of the actual, the attractions of when I first started becoming interested in Spanish, I mean, I first started studying it at secondary school in 1992, was actually going to Spain, going to concerts, learning more about Spanish music, etc. So this is really just, a, you know, it's a, it's almost a summation of um, what, what I've learned doing what I've loved for, well, now for 30 years, I guess. Um, that's, God, that's scary thinking it's nearly 30 years since I started learning Spanish. Um, I, and I also should say that actually one of the things that was interesting, or one of the things that I, that I thought was interesting about the initial invitation, um, which I'll say something about now, and hopefully I'm going to convince you of why I was right to, to change the initial invitation um, slightly, but you can decide, was the fact the initial invitation was to talk about the influence of Spanish popular and rock music um, you know, Brit British popular pop and rock music in the Spanish context. And actually what I want, I kind of said, yep, I'd be delighted to do that. But actually one of the things I would like to do would be to examine actually not so much just the, not just the influence that way, but some of the relationships, some of the ways in which actually there's been a kind of circuit of influence. And actually what's happened in Spain has also influenced what's happened in the UK, albeit admittedly to a lesser extent. Now, I've put on this um, first slide, somewhat provocatively maybe, the, um, an image of one of our national treasures. I mean, I guess one of the things that's interesting that for me is interesting is the fact that um, we're almost as, we're, you know, we're as good in Britain at rock music and pop music as we are bad or traditionally have been bad at food. Um, and maybe, to, you know, it might be because it's sacrilege talking about the, you know, the influence of Spanish, of Spanish popular music. And here I'm not talking about flamenco or traditional music. I'm talking about what music which operates in a kind of pop and rock idiom in the, um, in, on, on, the English, on English scenes, we might think, you know, no, the, the English are just, you know, this is what this is what we're good at. It's the equivalent of talking about the influence of English food on um, Spanish on Spanish cuisine, which I don't think many people would make, would make too strong a case for. But actually, I think that I think that's too simplistic. First of all, because as with you know anyone who's studied popular music knows, talking about origins and beginnings is always complicated because where do where do you go back to? I mean, we would probably end up in a field in Mississippi or, or in Africa. You know, it's, it's things the tradition evolves and it evolves from mutual influences and people taking it on, taking it to a next step. And also sometimes how it gets reappropriated in different cultures, it can mean different things on how people, you know, recreate their own local scenes. So, you know, now, even though we might not, you know, traditionally British cuisine might be considered not to be great, then what, what happened, you know, we've still got some excellent restaurants um, in Britain, many of which have actually um, drawn on culinary traditions from outside of the UK and, um, you know, adapted and some made them their own, sometimes with better, sometimes with worse consequences. And that's what I'm gonna try and argue today is what's happened with the relationships between pop and rock between Spain and the UK. I'm going to argue that although popular music, you know, popular music produced in the UK is being much more prominent, arguably you could say aesthetically superior to what's been produced in Spain. I'm going to argue that the conversations between the two cultures haven't always been registered as much as they could have been and actually understanding those in, and actually they've produced some productive things um, which hopefully, and I'm going to illustrate that with a couple of very concrete examples. And because we're in Manchester, because, well, I'm in Leeds, but because this is for the Leeds, you know, so a lot of the Institute of Savannah is based both in Manchester and Leeds. I'm going to talk about what I'm going to term the Leeds Ibiza, sorry, the Manchester Ibiza um, Barcelona connection. In any in any case, I also the other I want to go back. Um, I want to begin by just talking a little bit about some of our continuous um, idea of these cliches of why we often in the UK or people in the UK are likely to dismiss Spanish um, Spanish pop and rock. Well, I think one of the reasons is it hasn't helped. Hopefully, you can now see on the screen that that, that often the, the two two Julio Iglesias aside. Perhaps the songs which have been most successful um, or often been most successful coming from Spain have been seen as novel, have been novelty songs. So here I have images of, you may remember that, may remember this, of two of two number ones by Spanish artists in the UK charts. One is by the one on the left is Los del Rio. 
and um, with La Macarena, um, big hit in Spain before it then came over to, um, before it was then re-released here. And you may also remember Ketchup, Los, 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 the Ketchup song, the Ketchup song, which I think was also a number one. So here we have these two, these two novelty songs, um, which were big hits. And I think it says something about both the British attitude to, we're not, you know, if it always amazes, it amazes me when you see concerts, not just in Spain, but, you know, see concerts in other countries where the first language is not English. People's willingness to sing along with songs in a language which is not their own. I guess one of the things that's happened in the UK is that we're not accustomed always to doing that. And actually, with a sense in which we often, if we sing and allow, or if we hear songs in a language which is in our own, we almost dismiss them automatically as novelty songs or the songs in languages which aren't English that we're most willing to accept are those which are novelty songs. And that means, I think it says something about our condescending attitude. The term Europop is often used as a condescending term. It's used to look down on things. But actually, if we look at some early incursions of, um, or incursions of, there are some examples of British artists um, trying their hand at singing in Spanish. And this was actually, it was part of a strategy in, um, in the 60s especially, but it continues in different guises to the current days of trying to break into different markets. Um, so I'm going to, here we've got two examples, one of which is, um, as I'm sure you're all familiar with, well not the album, but you'll know Cliff Richard. Cliff Richard actually in the early 60s released an album of songs in Spanish called When in Spain. When I, was quite, when I went to investigate this further, the very curious thing about When in Spain is actually none, very few of the songs are actually from Spain. They're generally songs in Spanish from Latin American artists. But evidently, it was playing on the tourist boom to um, at the time of the 60s of lots of English people beginning to go on their first package holidays. And it also shows a certain kind of, you know, lack of sensitivity to specificities, uh, to local specificities, that no distinction is made. You know, it's all in Spanish. It doesn't really matter if it's, um, you know, if it's from Spain or Latin America. And then on the right, we have somebody who, um, Elvis Costello, who last year, in fact, re-recorded an artist from the 70s, some of you may be familiar with, who started off in the 70s, so he with punk, who's been going to Spain since the 60s because his father worked on the cruise ships as an entertainer. And he actually seems to have a more kind of engaged relationship with um, Spain and Spanish music. And he's re-recorded many of his hits with a selection of Spanish and Latin American artists in Spanish. And I'm just going to, we'll just watch a couple of, um, listen to a couple of clips of these, um, of these artists to see what you think of their versions in Spanish. This is Cliff Richard, first of all. Una vez, nada más, se entrega el alma con la dulce total. Yes. 
I think that's probably enough of that one. Let's have a let's have a listen to the. I'll just put in the chat the um the second one. Someone said it sounds beautiful. I'm not quite sure. I'm not sure if that's an ironic or a um, genuine. It sounds beautiful. I think we can probably we can probably had an you've had an idea of that one. I have to say it says something probably says something about my my taste and generation that my preference is for the um, is for the second one. So we've seen there some examples of um, of some relatively isolated examples of um, people who've um, you know in Brit English artists or British artists who have. Um, who have um, decided to sing in Spanish. Um, what then, the big question that what, that, you know, the kind of you might be, we might be thinking about is these are Elvis Costello, um, artist of the seventies, but began going to Spain in the sixties and he was, he was a ch child and adolescent, Cliff Richard, these package deals. We might, you may obviously question is what then was happening in Spain at that period musically in terms of popular music. Now, one of the things that the, um, when I first started work, working on this subject, it's about 10 years ago, kind of beyond, you know, I'd always been kind of casually interested, was the idea of what actually, um, what actually happened under Frankel with popular music. As I'm sure most of you are aware, Spain was a dictatorship from 1939 to 1975. And the popular narrative of what I had always been um, 
always being told or was kind of is done in documentaries when you watch it and watch it on Spanish, etc., is the fact that under Franco, rock and roll was banned or was heavily controlled and that it was with the transition that suddenly when Franco died, that suddenly rock and roll entered Spain. In actual fact, the story, the, the story is a lot more complicated than that. And it's actually not very realistic. I don't, I think it's kind of, be, I think there's a kind of certain romanticism which, is, which has gone into that story, which feeds into the idea of rock and roll being all about freedom, liberation, free, um, freedom expression, etc. Because, I think those Franco, the Franco regime, I don't think looked particularly positively on rock and roll music, but actually the major constraints against, against music from abroad going in and also rock and roll that's kind of, you know, Spanish rock and roll developing were actually more logistical and practical than ideological. And by that, what I mean is they related more to the fact that it was actually very, the, the standard, you know, the amount of the consumer power in Spain was less than in many other European countries. So it meant that artists weren't actually predisposed to tour in Spain very often. Um, I was curious to know why, for example, the Beatles had gone in 1965. The Beatles famously gave some con concerts in Las Ventas in Madrid. And actually, when you look into it, it's a very curious story. But the reason they went there was that the, was that the manager of the Beatles, Brian Epstein, was obsessed with bullfighting and had a kind of homoerotic obsession with bullfighters and saw that as his way in. Um, so actually, the Beatles were taken over there really as a sort of part of his, um, you know, part of an almost a personal relationship a professional project. Another issue related to economics was the fact that um, get, getting money in and out of Spain, so you can only take a certain amount of pesetas out, so that complicated things hugely. Um, and also meant that ink of a kind of issues with customs meant that guitars and drums were very expensive to buy um, in Spain. And what that meant was you didn't have the tradition of kind of local, you know, local local schoolmates deciding to get together and form a band as you did in places like Madrid and Manchester or Liverpool, etc. So the whole thing was complicated, you know, the whole thing was just logistically very difficult. But was also there was also protectionism on radios. So they only could play for every for every they had to play a certain number of Spanish songs for every foreign song they played. So this made everything very difficult, but not impossible. And one of the things that well, I was kind of I was fascinated, what I wanted to work out is when I started this project was how did rock and rock first start coming? To, you know, as live music to Spain, and also to say, you know, also on records, the first, the first international album which went to number one in the Spanish charts was the Rolling Stones' Exile in Main Street, and the man who you should now be able to see on the left of your screen, um, the Guy Mercader, was the first promoter who first first major promoter who began to bring music to um, promote concerts in Spain. And I tracked him down and did an interview with him to try and work out what, what had happened. He, he, brought Bruce, he brought Bruce Springsteen, brought my, he brought the Rolling Stones, he brought all these people over for the first time. And basically what he did um, is he did the transition from rock musicians, many of whom had holidayed in Spain in the 1960s, actually beginning to play there in the 1970s. Um, and the Rolling Stones first came in 1976. Um, they had actually been in Spain, had actually meant quite a lot, had already played quite an important role in, in their careers and lives before that. Um, Keith Richards, for example, after being arrested by the police in the aftermath of what he described as a riot outside a flamenco bar in Barcelona, Keith Richards recalls his first trip to Spain in spring 1967, primarily for his romance with Anita Pallenberg, the then girlfriend of his fellow band member Brian Jones, commencing on the road down to Valencia. Um, but Mercader promoted the, and I say Mercader, again, Mercader is quite a character in the sense of his, his family background. His, one of his uncles was the Italian director, Vittorio Vittorino de Sica, and another one of his uncles was Ramon Mercader, who was Trotsky's assassin. And he promoted their concert in 1976 in Barcelona's um, Bullring. You can see the advert for this here. Um, in as a loss leader designed to put him and Spain on the international touring map. The venue was actually half less than half full. 
um, at the time to 1976, just after Franco had died. And um, it was half full because the tickets were expensive and also going to concerts is a habit forming thing. So once you're not used, if you're not used to doing it, audiences are less, don't necessarily do it as regularly um, as they, you know, as once they've got into a habit of doing so. So actually people weren't, you know, the idea of going to concerts wasn't in, wasn't in young people's necessarily in their sort of routines. It wasn't something they were, you know, they did, they saw as something as natural. But he thought that it was actually a blessing in disguise because the, the, venue which was half full was the riot police then charged at revelers with tear gas for no particular reason and a full house would have resulted in serious and perhaps mortal injuries. I would argue and I think this is one of the reasons that pop that it's so interesting to look at pop and rock music from this period but during late Francoism and transition concerts became a litmus test for the nascent democracy. This was not the immediate this was not so much because of the um it wasn't so much because concerts were, um, you know, rock groups were necessarily anti-establishment, but more the fact that um, Spaniards hadn't been, you know, after dictatorship, Spaniards weren't necessarily used to gathering in big, in big peaceful groups and actually just having young people enjoying themselves. And I think that mere act of being together was part of, you know, how do you go from being a dictatorship to a democracy? In one sense, you know, there's obviously you change the laws, you introduce elections, but it's also about people's very way of being. And concerts, initial concerts were often sometimes quite violent, marred by violence, but that slowly changed. And by the early 80s, that wasn't the case. And I think that was part of young Spaniards learning to, you know, learning to coexist in a peaceful manner, which was so important. Um, and what and Mercader really began to, you know, once the Rolling Stones came, that meant other groups became more eager to come. That's not to say that logistical problems weren't solved overnight. Because I remember once when I was early on thinking about this, I looked at a band, I don't know if anyone remembers them, but a band from the 1970s dot, called Dr. Feelgood, who were, I sort of, they played a ridiculous number of times in Spain in the 70s, far more than any other group. And I thought, well, why is this? So I got in touch with, in touch with them, or the surviving members, and it turned out that the reason was that the manager, his parents had a house in Almeria. Again, the tourism, for, you know, a kind of tourism, Spain is a popular, a popular destination. And what they had done, what they did was, was that they, they had a next door neighbor who was a melon exporter. And they were able to, through his melon exporting business, when the band got paid in pesetas, they could get the money out without having to go through customs by going through him. So that made it much easier logistically for them to play than fund some other groups. He then apparently did the same, he learned from that trick and did the same thing as Greece began to open up as a, open up as a, um, as a um, destination. And what Gay Mercader did beyond bringing all these groups was he turned it into a professional operation. He began to actually make money out of these concerts, which there had been concerts in the 60s and 70s, apart, one to, apart from the ones he did, as Cliff Richard had gone over, but they'd generally been done not particularly professionally, um, and often by kind of idealistic hippies who sort of did them for fun. So most, the most, the clearest example of that was, um, was in Ibiza. Um, because what had happened in Ibiza from the 1960s onwards, um, as you may be you may be aware, Ibiza became a kind of play destination for more intrepid travelers in search of alternative lifestyles, often enhanced by the cost by the consumption of drugs. Actually, following again to the 70s, following Sid Vicious's from the Sex Pistols um, mortal heroin overdose in 1979, his mother published a book of family photographs, many of which featured him as a young, some of which featured him as a young boy, age nine, on holiday on the island in the 60s. There's a great film, if any of you, I don't know whether any of you have seen it, but if you haven't, I recommend it, called More from 1969, with a soundtrack by Pink Floyd, which um, documents um, Ibiza as a popular destination for foreign hippies. Um, various international acts such as Jimi Hendrix for Trogs and the Kinks had played Sergeant Pepper's nightclub to largely foreign audiences in the late 60s. So this is a very different image to what we have of Franco Spain, you know, a kind of Jimi Hendrix playing some, some Sergeant Pepper's nightclub. And actually an inaugural festival of popular music was staged there in 1977. And a nascent attempt to island branding took place the following year under the banner Musica Ibiza 78. Um, with claims that 
that Fleetwood Mac, the Bee Gees, and Pink Floyd had been booked to play. In the end, the only headline act to make the trip was Bob Marley, and it ended up being a massive, a massive problem because he wasn't paid. The following year, a similar thing happened with Eddie Grant, who wasn't willing to go on stage until he got paid, and then only did because um, if there, was, there seemed to be a riot unfolding about the fact he wouldn't go on. So the point I'm making about this is the late 70s is a kind of exciting moment as we, in the same way that in Spain's kind of exciting but also scary in a sense because there's no you know it's moving to be a democracy but who knows if this is actually going to be um, you know if this democracy is going to work if there might be a kind of return to dictatorship the the concerts have been organized are largely chaotic um, they're often they sometimes have violence but people who attend them remember the sense of euphoria and community at the time now in terms of actual musical production from Spain at this time, this is the period in which, as we move from Francoism to, um, to the democracy, we move from the tradition of the dominance of, predominance of politicized singer-songwriters, many of whom who took, predominantly took, influ took their influence actually from Paris, from France, to, but what, what, what is the kind of, what's generally referred to as the artist of La Movida, or La Movida Madrileña, which some of you may be, may be familiar with. And these artists are broadly, their chief reference point is largely punk, um, new wave, but there's often a criticism, there's often the sense in which they're considered to be especially the ones from Madrid. It's different, the scenes in the País Pastor. But if we just think about um, Madrid, they're often seen as being a kind of pale imitation of English British punk. Why is that? Well, it's seen as a pale imitation because it's seen as kind of copying it. It's often seen as lighter in musical terms. It's less aggressive. And related to that, it's sometimes seen as being, um, often seen as being less politicized. I think before I offer a kind of defense of what I would see about, uh, I would say about the um, La Movida Madalena or some of the musicians that come out of that, I'm going to put in the chat a, um, a couple of, a clip of um, Alaska, one of the most famous artists to come from this period. And then we go to see a clip of the Sex Pistols. And I think that you'll see that I think the contrast, although they're both broadly can be brought under his banner punk or new punk, I think you'll see that there's quite a big difference both in terms of the iconography and the musical style. So I'll just stop sharing for a second and then put this in the chat. <laughs> Me paso el día bebiendo la 
I'm now going to put the second one by Mr. After after you've been dancing, you can now be more nihilistic. Um, and I'm going to put in the second one from a Sex Pistol. So I think you can now stop the Sex Pistols. Um, 
hopefully that hasn't damaged anyone's eardrums too much. Um, so I think the, you know, the the point of the, I think it's obvious when you look at those that um, that the Sex Pistols one is much more aggressive, much, um, you know, much more um, in terms of both its musical content and actually its lyrics. The reason that I, um, I think that the thing that's slightly unfair about the, um, about the, um, the kind of comparison is the fact that the, and the fact that these are such different moments in society, but perhaps, you know, if music both reflects and shapes society, what was needed in Spain at that time was actually possibly different than what was needed in the UK. And also linked to that, um, and actually perhaps, you know, the, the Sex Pistols one is explicitly political about being anti-monarchist in the, in the sense of this Queen's Jubilee. Um, but actually, the, and the Spanish, what, the Spanish Alaska is, like, as with many of the songs about La Movida, from La Movida, is largely about personal rather than political freedoms. Some people have seen that as an irresponsible retreat from the political at a time when, you know, it wasn't altogether clear that the, um, that, you know, there was still the coup in 1980, the coup attempt in 1981, but, you know, the, the kind of dangers of returning to dictatorship were still there in Spain. But other people have argued, and I've got certain sympathy with this, that actually what was really needed was a kind of, was a, a personal, was an acceptance of personal freedoms, a wider range of sexualities, and actually just the idea of being able to dance, be able to do as you like, um, not to be judged for it, was actually a very important part of a democratization process. What is true, I think, is the sense that, going back to what I said earlier in the talk about the cost of instruments, the cost of music, is that most of the people, I mean, like, there's exceptions in both cases, but most of the artists associated with punk in the UK context were generally from working class backgrounds, and men, most from the, in La Vida were from middle and upper middle class backgrounds. They, had the, you know, they were the people with the money to have the instruments, and also, crucially, they were people who traveled so what happened was, with someone like Alaska, every time she went to London or New York, she bought up all the latest records there were. And actually, there is a sense of appropriating, reappropriating, which you get away with in those days before internet, um, before, um, you know, before MTV, because often they could take things that most people in Spain wouldn't have been aware of or have known about. Um, and But I think there still is. A kind of art to be had to be had in this kind of act of I think we could maybe see the Mobida as an act of curation in which the source materials which were curated had a, were largely influenced by UK by the UK or music produced music and culture produced in the UK. That said, what is also interesting is the fact that at this time a number of um, you artists associated with British punk. Um, took a great interest in what, what had happened in Spain, especially what had happened in Spain during the Civil War and how that was playing out in the politics of today. On the left hand side of what you see on the, you can see a picture of Joel Strummer, the singer of The Clash um, in Spain, who and he became much more aware, much more politicized by, um, about Spain because the girlfriend of a bassist of The Clash, Paul Simmons' girlfriend, was who formed part of the largely British punk band The Slits, um, pa Paloma, had come to move to London and told him about it. Says something about um, the fact, the fact about British lack of ignor ignorance of languages and foreign cultures at this time. But they la that she was mocked for using olive oil and was actually nicknamed Palmolive because apparently pa Paloma was too difficult to pronounce. But she kind of prompted his interest of Joe Strummer in the mythology of a civil war, Federico Garcia Lorca, something that was also raised in um, by the Stranglers in their hit Spain, and also by the um, the Pogues, um, the Irish punk, uh, well, semi could be classified some of their songs as punk um, band who had Lorca's Novena. Um, all three, you know, and I think one of the reasons I was thinking of trying to explanations of why there was interest in the Civil War, I think, and what I'm going to give is a simplified answer. I actually think anyone interested in this, the talk that Maria Bastianis is going to give in October on Lorca, I think we'll talk about how Lorca and the Civil War featured in the imaginary of the left in Spain in the late 70s and early 80s, and we'll give a more nuanced vision. But one reason that I think is, one explanation is, I think there was, a, there was these were punk bands who were very much on the left, 
but they didn't want to be kind of too celebratory about the defeat of Nazism in the Second World War because they were also resisting the smugness or the kind of triumphalism of the Queen's Jubilee, which was heavily linked to that. So I think the looking to Spain was a way of kind of celebrating a victory of the left, of a defeat over, fa or not a defeat, or lamenting um, what happened with fascism, perhaps celebrating the fact it might have been disappearing in the 70s, um, which was attractive to them. And I'm just going to give, I'm just going to again put in the in the chat just a very brief, we'll just watch very briefly the song, perhaps the most famous punk song about the, um, about Spain and the Spanish Civil War, which is Spanish Bombs by The Clash. Uh, je te fais chanter maintenant pour vos parents et mes parents. Hopefully. Sorry, I realized I didn't mute myself at the beginning, so you probably got it in stereo for a little bit. Apologies about that. So that was just one example of um, of the 
of how punk took an interest in what was happening in um, what was happening in Spain, both in the 30s and in the present day. And actually, the, probably, the, I mean, it's not really a punk song. But you can see the legacy of that in one of the most unusual number one hit to have um, to have happened it, to have um, for us to have to have hit number one in the UK, which was the Manic Street Preachers. If you tolerate this, your children will be next in the late 1990s. Now, then, what you found was this is punk took the original kind of English punks had a huge, and in New York punks, in fact, suddenly became hugely popular, suddenly were touring constantly in Spain. And I was wondering why this was. I mean, it's partly they were popular, but then I also realized there was two other explanations for it. One of which was the fact that suddenly in the 80s, following the following the victory of the PSOE in the National Socialist Party in the 1982 elections, suddenly there was lots of subsidies available to put on concerts in Spain. And what that meant was that you know there was you know there was more you know there was money to bring them over and secondly was the more tragic side because there was the drugs in the 80s suddenly became very cheap and very easily available in Spain and a lot of not all but many of the punk artists had hard drug addictions and actually going to Spain was very attractive to them because they could get they could get they could get cheap easy fixes and actually that's where that, the, the drug link is also instrumental to what I'm going to talk about in the final part of this comment and final part of this um, talk, which is I kind of thought was apt considering that we're in um, considering where we are, which is what I've termed the Barcelona Ibiza Manchester Nexus, which is which is a connection between these three places that you wouldn't necessarily well Barcelona Ibiza you might connect, but you wouldn't necessarily but you wouldn't necessarily expect to form this triangle. And I've just um, on the screen, which hopefully you can all see, you can just see an advert for a um, White Lines, which is a Netflix series done a couple of years ago about a group of kids going from Manchester to, um, who've gone to Manchester in the 90s um, to Ibiza. Second one is the Manchester Bar in Ibiza in Barcelona, which is still open. And the third is an advert for a club night in 1980, in late 80s in Barcelona, in Madrid, sorry, in Manchester, advertising the fact that it's got Balearic, Balearic beats. And actually, I was in Piccadilly Daily Records the other day in, in Manchester, and I noticed they still got a section labelled Balearic Beats. So how did this, how did this counterintuitive, or at least counterintuitive to me, come about? Well, it largely happened because of um, a figure called Pino Sagliocco, an Italian, in fact, who worked for a time based in, um, for Mercader, but then struck up um, on his own. And what he happened, what he did, what he did was, was he set up the um, the, 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 the club Q in Ibiza as a platform to launch acts. Um, at this time, um, Robert Elms, a journalist for London's influential style magazine, The Face, said how, quote, Barcelona was a city rediscovering itself and Pino Sagliocco led the way. So he was somebody who was operating between Ibiza and um, and um, Barcelona, you know, an easy, easy um, ferry ride away. What then happened was, um, is he was very adept at getting to know, largely on Ibiza, largely in Ibiza and Barcelona, international acts. And actually, both I think it's no, both him and Mercader. Mercader, you know, is of Catalan origin, but largely brought up in France. In France, it's often largely been non. Spanish promoters who've been most successful um, in the Spanish context, at least in the early years. Um, so Pino Sadlioco met Roger Taylor in an Ibiza nightclub after a, after a drummer from Queen had bought a holiday home on the island. Sadlioco then attended the 1985 Live Aid concert in Wembley Stadium, which sent a new benchmark in television magnifying the event, impact of mega events. And sadly, Oco further developed his friendship with Taylor, who then introduced him to the band's manager, Jim Beach, and secured the Spanish dates for Queen's 1986 Magic Tour. This was the first time that sadly, Oco had really begun to intrude onto Mercader's terrain. Um, and sadly, Oco used saw with Queen that television was he could use it as a way of not only of promoting his concerts, he did documentaries on them, um, he did news features, etc. Um, the frequent association by this time of live music with democratization and modernization, combined with an unprecedented attention to youth cult subcultures from the t t national television, the national broadcaster in Spain, and meant that the arrival of international acts was considered to be newsworthy. 
In an interview for Televisión Española's Informe um, Semanal, Freddie Mercury said that of all the great Spanish institutions, the Barcelona-born Montserrat Caballé, who he had seen on stage at London's Royal Opera House, was the greatest and that he was the person that he most longed to meet. Montserrat's brother, on, to, then on the back of that, organized a meeting with um, the two stars in February 1987 in Barcelona, which then led to um, them recording the song Barcelona, which you may, which was used to promote the Olympic Games of 1982, um, which you may, may remember. Mutual professional and personal admiration between Caballé and Mercury aside, the collaboration held strategic advantages for both singers. Caballé was no longer capable of taking on the demanding rules and grueling tours that had established her as one of the biggest opera stars in the world. The pre, um, furthermore, she'd fallen out with the management of the Liceo Opera House in Barcelona. Mercury knew he was HIV positive and was unlikely to ever tour again. Sadly, Ocol's connections in both Ibiza and Barcelona made him uniquely placed to stage manage the relationship between these two superstars for maximum effect. Mer Freddie Mercury had discovered the island of Ibiza on that aforementioned 1986 magic, magic tour, where he stayed at a hotel run by Tony Pikes, who had developed his finger into a commercial concern when Michael Pearson, the fourth Viscount Caldre, who, as a curiosity, small world it is, great grandfather, amongst other things, endowed the chair of Spanish studies here at the University of Leeds, ran, ran out of rooms for his guests at his own villa. The hotel of Pike subsequently provided a set for Wham's Club Tropicana promotional video, which some of you may remember, an MTV fixture for many years, which as of December 2018 has over 20 million views on YouTube. Subsequent re regulars to this hotel run by the Englishman include Julio Iglesias, Joan Baez, who unexpectedly, you wouldn't expect the veteran, the veteran protest singer became an unexpected clubbing partner for Julio Iglesias' daughter, Chabali Iglesias, Grace Jones, and the lead singer of Queen. Mercury was particularly impressed by the cocaine-fueled parties in the VIP area of the two nightclub. And by this time, the most exclusive of Ibiza's nocturnal haunts was more than just a club. It hosted live concerts, had its own in-house magazine, Ibiza Divina, and saw no contradiction in hosting the Miss Tanga Awards at the same time as opening an art gallery. It was here that there was a gala performance in which the song Barcelona was launched, designed to raise funds for the Olympic city. Mercury, or Freddie Mercury, also celebrated his 41st birthday at Pike's Hotel. My, I'm 41 next year, next week. I think my birthday is going to be somewhat less um, rock and roll, less exciting. A giant birthday cake in the shape of Gaudi's Sagrada Familia was, was said to have been flown over from Berk, from was meant to have been flown over from Barcelona on Mercury's private jet, but it got destroyed in a bumpy landing. An impromptu replacement was prepared in the form of a giant sponge cake decorated with the lyrics to Barcelona. That same song, Barcelona, was designed to provide the centerpiece of La Nit, a televised spectacle coordinated by Sadlioco in 1988 to herald the arrival of the Olympic flag from Seoul and to inaugurate the Cultural Olympics, designed as accompaniment to the Olympic Games and a more ambitious replication of a strategy which had been pursued for the 1982 um, World Cup in Madrid. So this is all going on. At the same time, What's also happening is, you know, this is kind of high call, you know, the sort of very rich people in um, Ibiza. There's also a more what we might call popular and populist dimension going on. Um, in that groups from Manchester, such as New Order, began to um, began to holiday in Ibiza. New Order's commercial success and experiences in Ibiza nightclubs, I'm hoping I'm sure you're all familiar with a band from Manchester New Order, um, inspired them to open the Hacienda Club in Manchester, one of the most legendary nightclubs um, in UK history. Resident DJ Mike Pickering had taken what he termed his first little disco biscuit, i.e. ecstasy, in Barcelona in 1987 and was delighted to find of a Happy Mondays, an upcoming band of Ibiza regulars sold their own supplies of ecstasy back in Manchester. By 1990, an increasing broad demographic of UK clubbers saved all year round to escape Thatcherite Britain to discover the mythical origins of their new DJ heroes. In 1990, 
um, Channel 4 aired a short film about chilling. I've put a link to it in the PowerPoint, which you can look at afterwards. I don't think we've got time to do it now, but it's a fascinating documentary, um, which follows predominantly working class revelers from England on holiday, largely from the north of England. The local authorities in Ibiza were concerned about the potential for illegal activities being filmed with these documentaries, and some venues, such as Amnesia, denied access to the crew. But the program was a cultural phenomenon that reached viewers far beyond the usual, the usual niche demographic for such programs. Two and a half million UK viewers turned into what young everyday Brits praise for lack of ghettoization, so the range of different musical styles in music venues such as Q, which was described as Disneyland for clubbers. And so this was a real, and much of his music actually didn't necessarily come from, um, come from, wasn't being, you know, wasn't the original records weren't made in Spain, but the DJs were, were largely Spanish. Um, some, some of them were Spanish, some were also Argentinians who had originally come over fleeing the dictatorship there. And what, going back to that term I used earlier, that sense of curation, what the thing was, was the music, the way it was put together, the song, the way the songs were mixed, the setting, the sun, meant that it took on different meanings it meant to the clubbers than it did if it had been done in different contexts. Um, and this is really, I think, the late 80s, early 90s is the real kind of peak of collaborations between Anglo-Spanish collaborations and also often between artists working in different genres. So I've already mentioned the Freddie Mercury and Montserrat Caballé collaborating on Barcelona. Um, you've also got the, um, the wonderful um, flamenco artist Cameron de la Isla. Um, who was it who would upset purists initially by adapting by incorporating rock so elements of rock and other popular genres into his music but he came to record an Abbey Road um, um, an album with a Royal Philharmonic Orchestra um, unfortunately by that stage his heroin had taken you know he was in, he was in a state that he wasn't able to actually tour of that as effectively as he might have done if he'd been better health and also the, the heavy metal band Edoes del from Zaragoza Edoes del Silencio came to play in London they recorded in London as well um, although they played in smaller venues in London and they had in many other territories in Europe and I think that goes back to that idea of English chauvinism of the reluctance to listen to rock in in um, you know in languages other than English um, I think oh, there are reasons for, you know, I think that's, that's a shame. I think oh, there are reasons for hope. Um, and it's interesting that actually now in the 21st century to bring us right up to the present, there's actually more, op there's more op opportunities than ever to see Spanish pop rock concerts in the UK. And actually, interestingly, I was seeing there was an advert here and I've put some examples of um, one from Joaquin Sabina playing the Royal Albert Hall last year, an advert for Tangana playing um, a, um, and actually an advert for the tributes to Edoes del Silencio play in London. Um, and they're, um, interestingly, their play of a tribute band to Edoes del Silencio is actually playing a bigger venue than the original band had played when they played back in the 90s at the Marquee Club. I mean, there's many reasons we could talk about about this. Um, why was this boom in pop rock concerts? I don't think it's that suddenly English audiences have discovered Spanish rock. I think it's more to do with the fact that actually a greater number of Spaniards living in the UK, um, working young Spaniards living and working here, but also the fact, I think, the kind of the popularity of music coming from Latin America, often in UK, as perhaps as, as perhaps created a boost or a greater willingness to listen to music in um, in in Spanish. That's certainly the case in terms of Tang of C Tangana. Um, probably less so in terms of of Eros del Tributo Eros del Silencio and Joaquin Sabina, who I think are more predominantly aimed at the di Spanish diaspora, Hispanic diaspora here. Anyway, I think I'm going. I want to leave it there so that I've got enough time. We've got enough time for questions, um, comments from yourselves. But thank you very much for your um, for your attention. Thank you, Duncan. It was fantastic. So now, as uh, you mentioned, we have some time for questions and answers. You can put it down on our chat, and I will uh, uh, ask Duncan what you want to to know about uh, this uh, relations, musical relations between Britain and, and Spain. So I would like myself to, to ask, uh, you know, uh, one of the paramount uh, uh, cooperations that you mentioned, Barcelona and uh, 
Freddie Mercury and Montserrat mm -hmm. Caballé. Had you got information how these relations uh, was? It was uh, something that came from the the artist, or was something uh, in relation to the promotion of the city? I can see we're getting um we've got people from Manchester trying to peek into our um peek into the camera here. Um no, I mean I think there was a mixture. I think there was a it's it's if you read the it's not surprising if you read the people who come from Queen's Circle, they make out that Montserrat Caballé was more keen than he was and chased him. If you read the people from Montserrat Caballé's side, they say that they that Queen that Freddie Mercury did the chasing. My sense is that it was a genuine admiration between the two artists. But the two people very much pushing it were Pino Sagliocco, because he had this big idea that he thought that musical branding could be a thought, could help Barcelona with the Olymp with publicizing Olympics. And actually, many of the concerts I remember being nine, nine or ten and watching on British TV, the concerts of Madonna, of Tina Turner from the Olympic Stadium. So I think that was a shrewd move. And I think the brother of Montserrat Caballé was very so organized these organized this get together in Barcelona um, between the two of them. Um, and I think that, I think there was a genuine sense. I mean, Freddie Mercury knew at that stage he wasn't going to be able to tour again. She was looking for kind of projects which he could, which he could still realize his ambitions before he got too ill to do them. So I think to answer, the short answer is, I think it was, it came from managers, et cetera, but I think it was greeted with great enthusiasm by the artist. I don't think it was done for purely cynical reasons. Yes, without that, it wouldn't have worked. So we have two uh, two pairs. Um, first of all, uh, well, there's no comment from Emma Ratley. Uh, yeah. Really interesting talk. Thank you. And then Stephanie Bargit says, "It is really fair to compare Alaska and the Sex Pistols. Sex Pistols, sorry, yeah. wouldn't be more accurate to compare Alaska to Blondie." Yeah. The Sex Pistols uh, were more like the rock radical Basco, maybe your thoughts? Yeah, well, it's a very, it's a very good, very well informed um, question. I mean, actually, it was interesting. I was thinking about the, um, and actually the Sex Pistols weren't as important in Spain as they were in other countries. I mean, they actually, they tried to, when the Sex Pistols reunited in 96, they tried to, um, they tried to bring over the Sex Pistols. That's if they didn't sell any. Guy Mercader couldn't sell tickets for it, had enough tickets for it. Um, I think you're, and actually the biggest of a link. Well, you're right with the, with the rock radical Vasco. And I was thinking actually, I went to see some of you may be familiar with the band from Pais Vasco La Polla Records, and I went to see there when they got back together. Um, when they, when they, and I kind of thought when I went to see their stage show a couple of years ago in Madrid, which I really enjoyed, but it was very, very derivative. Even the iconography looked very similar to what the Sex Pistols have done on their reunion tour. But to ask for the comparison with Blondie, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I think actually it's, and I don't think Alaska would compare herself with the Sex Pistols. I think what I was talking about was the traditional criticism of La Movida of being a kind of depoliticized punk. Um, and actually the comparison with Blondie is very good because you, um, I don't know if you noticed on the back of that clip, there's some the scene of these um the scene of the trumpeteers are in the masts actually would have been a very was a very similar um setup in the video of island of lost souls from madonna so from blondie um which i think is just taken directly across um i guess it's the fact that what happened is is people defending la Mobida have wanted to defend it in terms of political terms and then if you do it in though if you do it in those strictly terms of then it always ends up being shown as wanting or lacking in compared to british punk and i think you're absolutely right it's just it's not comparing like with like um, it is true, Alaska was a fan of um, the Sex Pistols. I always like the story of when she came over to London with her grandmother. They went to the King's Road and they saw Johnny Rotten and they ran after Johnny Rotten to get his, the grandmother of Alaska ran after Johnny Rotten to get his autograph for her granddaughter. Apparently he was quite nice about it. Um, but I just think that image is just wonderful. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, and I think, you're, I think you're right. It probably is unfair. It is unfair to make the comparison, but the comparison was made and is still made. Thank you. Any more questions or comments? Yeah. Uh, yes, we have another one from Charles Morgan. Yeah. There were really fierce punk bands in Spain in the early ages. Ultimo yeah. Resorte from Barcelona, Las Vulpes from Bilbao, La Broma Catan, yeah. etc. If you like uh, punk music, have a look at them yeah. on YouTube. 
Okay, yeah. it was just a comment from there are so many bands, yeah. Punk yeah. bands in the I mean, I guess why, I guess one of even today. I mean, I guess one of the criticism, one of the one of the resentments of of La Movida Madalena from other from I guess artists and some audiences is the fact that when that they that people talk about them repeatedly that when you know it was documentaries on the early 80s they bring them out. But exactly there was all these other bands going on, all these different scenes. And of course the Basque country was there was more genuine, you know, with the situation with Eta, the independent, there was a more sense of and actually the fact that the Basque country had a more heavy industry, perhaps what was going on in the Basque country sociologically was closer to what was happening in the UK um, than, than Madrid. Um, was of, you know, because you could give a, one could give a whole other talk on that subject. Thank you. I think it was an early one about stacks and Motown I spotted from... Um, um, oh, it was a direct message was sent. Uh, I didn't see that. Too. Yeah, so actually, it's a, it's a good, it's a good question. So if you don't mind, I'm going to. Uh, no, you can, you can. Oh, yeah. No, so Andrew Please Johnson. Go ahead. Yeah. Andrew Johnson says, well, um, did Spain never embrace Tamla Motown or Stax, which obviously peaked before democracy? I mean, that's a that's a that's an interesting. I mean, actually, it's. I think that's partly to do with the fact of how music got across. I mean, when they did enter, they entered more actually where there was American air bases in Spain in the 60s. And actually the areas around Torrejon um, and Rota where in Andalusia was often where those records went. And that um, that was where those, those, um, those records and those scenes did become more popular. I remember speaking to the, I remember Guy Mercader saying to me, and I'm not sure, well, I'm not sure he's right, but who am I to doubt? He's a man who's very successfully promoted lots of concerts. He probably knows something that um, I don't. He said, he said, I tried, he said he brought Tina Turner over in the 70s when he said Tina Turner, so it was before Tina Turner had a big comeback. And he said he lost a lot of money on it. And he said his view was Spanish, Spanish audiences just don't respond well to black um, to black artists, um, or at least didn't in that period. Um, I mean, Bob Marley went, so there are exceptions. But his view was that, and he just he, he just thought it was too it was a cultural difference too far. Um, who knows if that's true or not? But what certainly is the case is that that um, that, that it didn't come across. What is interesting now is the kind of Northern Soul sort of nights, you know, Northern Soul, another example of kind of cultural reappropriation, you know, kind of these great soul records being played in places like Wigan, round, you know, in, in Britain in the late 60s and early 70s, there's actually a real sense of that now in Spain, there's actually special Northern Soul nights. So belatedly, Motown and Stax are getting their day, but admittedly not on a kind of mass scale and a kind of small subcultural scene. Uh, we have a comment from Richard Sellers, really interesting presentation. Gracias, Don Campeso and Carlos, Hildo Cervantes. Um, he said that just a few thoughts brought to mind. I lived in Madrid in 1985 to 1987. It was fascinating scene. Chile on the La Movida, I missed the hype, 78 to 82. It was such a free sand city, an explosion of nightlife and music, arts and culture. I think that was the context and throughout Spain in different ways, as you say, there was a real punk DAG spirit of sort. Sarah Brown uh, says, are there any examples of Hispanic musicians, bands that wrote uh, some songs with a political tone during the regime of the transition? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's the, I mean, there's, we can go back to the, there was a long tradition of singer songwriters who I didn't, I didn't talk about who were very oppositional. And then a lot of these bands in the, a lot of, like a couple of people in the chat, a lot of these bands from the Pais Basco, um, and to a lesser extent, Catalonia and other areas. But, you know, some of the, um, the lyrics of some of the, some of the punk bands from um, the Pais Basco were incredibly um, politicized. You know, a lot of them, are, you know, about the situation of political repression, a lot of comments about the fact for the police, you know, there was still a lot of police brutality in the 80s, despite the fact they were ostensibly living in a democratic times. And then uh, this will be the last one from Stephanie Borges again. How do you think punk has developed over the years since the 80s and 90s? Do you think there is still a punk scene in, and do you think the influence of British bands is still prominent now? Well, I think there's lots. Of, I think there's lots of there's lots of kind of mini questions within that within that question. I mean, what I'd say is is what's interesting is 
there's still a phenomenal audience for British punk bands. I mean, I'm always amazed when you go to Spain, you sort of see these punk bands from the 70s, um, from the UK, still tour, you know, still doing a lot of touring in Spain. I think my impression is, but I have to say, I'm not, I'm not listening to the new records, so I'm not informed of this. My sense is that probably still the the um, Bast, you know, punk of kind of aggressive punk is the País Basco. I'm always, a, you know, when I go, when I was in the town, the kind of local town festivities in the village, village quite outside of San Sebastian, they kind of had a young punk band there um, playing. Um, but I have to say, I'm not keeping up hugely to date with what's coming out. So, you know, this is largely impressionistic. I think it was definitely, even if it's not a direct influence, I think still think the British punk scene is seen as a point of reference. Um, there. And of course, now, unlike what I was saying in the, what you do have, you have young people, you know, with YouTube, with the internet and things, you have much more, pe you have people able to go, you know, you have lots of young people still very interested in, in punk bands from the 70s, even they can go and rediscover it. Um, so I think it is, um, it's still important, but not in it, but you don't see it's not occupying the kind of, you know, it doesn't have a central place that it did in the late, in the late 80s and throughout the late 80s and into the 90s. All right. So thank you very much, Donka. Thank you to, to our public and our audience. Uh, the time come to an end. It was really fantastic, very interesting. And uh, as we can sense and feel, uh, it's a subject, a topic that could be, uh, be discussed during uh, many more lectures. So thank you very much. Muchísimas gracias. And uh, I hope to have you soon again. Thank you. Oh, it's always a pleasure. And just to say to everybody, but at the beginning of the PowerPoint is my email. So if anyone has any follow-up questions or comments, feel free to just get in touch with me directly. It'd be a pleasure to speak to you. Thank you. Thank you so much to everyone.